Representative Patsy Hazelwood from Tennessee, thank you so much for joining us on Marcy's Law Interview Series, Why We Do What We Do. Um, first of all, happy Happy New Year. And um, thank you for taking the time. I know the week between Christmas and New Year's is really, really busy. Um, but you had told me how this was important to you. And um, I really, really want to thank you for taking this time um, today. This interview series is something that we started in Marcy's Law really during the time of COVID because like everyone else, we didn't have a chance to really get out to the different states and meet with people face to face. And we started to try to thank and promote all of the people who are so important to victims' rights and for advocating for victims all across the country. We came up with the idea of the name, why we do what we do, was because we started to find that basically everyone who's in this work, whether it's from a legislative standpoint um, or from an advocacy standpoint, is in it for certain personal reasons. And sadly, sometimes it's because of a tragic incident um, that has propelled them to become spokespeople um, for the next uh, people who have to go through the the foreign uh, the foreign land, uh, if you will, of the criminal justice system, and it's also very intimidating. Um, we can get into that a little bit because that's one of the things that you talk about is uh, it's such a tough system to navigate, and it's almost um, re-traumatizing at some points um, to put victims through after having gone through what they've gone through already, um, another traumatizing experience, which is trying to figure out how to work through this criminal justice system. Um, Marcy's Law started um, uh, a while ago in 2009 by Dr. Henry Nicholas, who was trying to honor his his late sister. And um, his late his, his sister Marcy was a UC Santa Barbara um, college student who was tragically murdered by um, an ex-boyfriend in 1983. And after burying um, her, his sister, uh, Dr. Nicholas and his mom uh, were at the grocery store coming back from the funeral service at the gravesite. And they ran into uh, Marcy's murderer. And they had absolutely no idea that this man was going to be released. Um, and as you might imagine, that was uh, quite traumatizing. Um, and really just exacerbated um, what they had already been through. Uh, Dr. Nicholas has dedicated his life to honoring um, not just his sister, but to try to ensure that victims um, are able to um, have equal and enforceable constitutional rights uh, as they go forward um, in, in, in trying to navigate the criminal justice system. Uh, started in 2009, passed in the state of California, and has since passed in multiple states, and, and now one in three Americans live in a state where Marcy's Law is enshrined in their state constitution, and we're continuing forward. And our next state that we're con concentrating on is Tennessee. Um, so I want you to tell us a little bit about, um, first of all, how you got into public service. And I should start by thanking you, because you were the original sponsor of Marcy's Law in Tennessee. Um, and started it in the House. Um, and Senator Stevens, who was a guest last month on Why We Do What We Do, is um, the sponsor in the Tennessee State Senate. And we'll talk about how that's the next step. And I also saw that you two were guest authors of an op-ed in support of Marcy's Law as well. So thank you for that. Um, so Rep Hazelwood, uh, with that intro, tell us a little bit about how you got into public service, because this has not been a career for you. You've decided to serve the public after... Um, a, uh, a career in the in the private sector. That's true. It's not, um, it, you know, certainly, definitely not a career path that I saw early on for myself. Um, I grew up, I was born in Tennessee. I'm a sixth generation Tennessean, but I grew up, I was born um, just right across the Tennessee state line. My parents moved to Alabama when I was um, a couple of years old, and I grew up there, but came back to Tennessee for um, for college and for work. Went to work right out of college with uh, the Bell System at the time. Um, was part of Bell South, um, you know, at that particular time, and went through all of the things with divestiture. I don't know if people even remember that when there was one Bell System, and um, I was worked in Nashville 
with the company. And then my husband and I were transferred to Chattanooga in 1980. And so um, I retired from Bell South, had gone back to being AT&T at the time of, of my retirement. And for a good deal of the time that I worked for the AT&T Corporation, part of my job was doing government relations for the company. So that meant I worked with local governments. I worked with the state government, spent a little time in D.C. Um, with our federal officials. And there's just something I always felt that, um, first of all, I found it incredibly interesting. But also, I realized that it really makes a difference in people's lives. I have two grandchildren at the time that I first ran for office. They were seven and nine, respectively. So um, it was important to me to make Tennessee as good a place as it can be. I want them to stay here. I'm very, um, you know, very selfish in that regard. I want to make sure that that Tennessee has opportunities for them, no matter um, you know what career path they choose. That um, I hope to have them close by for a long time. So uh, with those selfish reasons and the fact that I had worked. Um, for a short period, Governor Haslam, who was uh, the predecessor of our current Governor Bill Lee, I had worked for him after I retired from Bell South for um, doing economic development as a director for economic development for the state for Southeast Tennessee. And again, it just showed me how impactful decisions that are made in Nashville um, to some regard, in daily lives, I truly feel like the decisions that are made at the local government level and the state government level have more impact on, um, you know, our citizens' daily lives than perhaps some of the things that happen in Washington. So I, I the person who had this position, uh, who represented me in Nashville, chose not to run again. And I decided it was an opportunity that if I was ever going to you know, take that step, um, that was the time to do it. So 10 years ago now, um, I decided to run and have been serving. I'm in my, my fifth term um, in the state house. I found it incredibly rewarding. I've been fortunate to serve on um, committees where I think I have background and expertise. I also was part of a group that started a bank here in, in Chattanooga in 2008. So uh, I had that banking experience and that tied with the communications and telecommunications business experience. Felt gave me sort of a, a good perspective um, to look at how, again, state rules impact and can either impede or accelerate business investment and jobs for Tennesseans. So um, that's how I got here. And the our Speaker of the House has chosen to allow me to serve as Chair of the Finance Committee, which um, I've been doing that for the past two terms. Prior to that, I was Vice Chair of that committee. So um, again, it's been an opportunity for me to use the skills that I think I developed during a career, a long career, um, with in telecommunications and in banking, uh, just in a in a different way in government. Well, it's certainly a different way, and it's certainly a big difference between being someone who works in government relations um, to then make the leap, which is not an insignificant leap, to actually putting your name on the ballot and to be a person who's actually in the arena. Um, those conversations are usually family conversations. At that point, you said you had grandchildren. Um, my guess is there were a lot of other people who had um, a say and an opinion on whether or not you were going to start to put yourself out there, um, which is not easy, especially these days. Um, how did that conversation go? And was everybody, because you got to be all in if you're going to do that and put your name on the ballot um, and do what it takes to get elected and then to serve. How did those conversations go? You know, my family was supportive, I think surprised uh, to some degree. I know my mother, who was, I am so blessed. My mother is 97 years old and she is still with us and still very uh, cognitively just fine. Thank you so much. 
when I told her that I was going to run, she was just silent for a long time. And then she said, I wanted a lot of things for you, Patsy, but I never wanted you to be a politician. So I told her I wasn't going to be a politician. I plan to be a public servant. So that's what I've tried to do. So your mom was the one that was the toughest. <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure she's incredibly proud, though, of how, how your career has gone. And I have to tell you, um, we at Marcy's Law are so proud, but also indebted to the fact that you um, have helped us and took this on early, um, the, the whole issue of victims' rights. And victims' rights, um, to take on victims' rights in Tennessee and to try to enshrine victims' rights through Marcy's Law and the Tennessee State Constitution – um, if you could just explain to people, it's not necessarily some radical culture change or shift for Tennesseans. In fact, in about a quarter of a century ago, in 1998, um, the Crime Victims Bill of Rights or a Crime Victims Bill of Rights was passed statewide by close to 90 percent of voters in Tennessee uh, to enshrine victims rights, some victims rights um, or form thereof in the state constitution. Um, so tell us a little bit about. Uh, what exists now, but the gaps that need to be filled by passage of Marcy's Law? Well, I think the, as you say, Tennesseans are very supportive, and I think it's just a matter of, of simple justice. We are very careful in this country to give defendants to make sure that they're, they have their full rights, that they have the full protection of the law, and that's that's great. We certainly should do that. Nobody wants an innocent person to be punished for something that they didn't do. But at the same time, we don't have that that level of protection, if you will, for victims. The bill that was passed or the constitutional amendment that was passed in 1998, I think most Tennesseans who voted for that, and it passed by a wide majority, as you said, I think most would have expected that to sort of take care of any discrepancy between victims' rights and defendants' rights. But there are some holes in that, if you will, the biggest one being you mentioned earlier, enforceability. So I think with Marcy's Law, what we're looking to do is, is to simply make sure that victims and defendants are treated equally in the system. And unfortunately, sometimes victims are no longer with us. So that translates to victims' families in the case of homicides and, and so forth. And as you mentioned um, in your introduction of how Marcy's Law even began with Dr. Nichols, I think when people are, most people don't ever have interaction with the justice system. You know, we just don't. Most people are law abiding and a traffic ticket or a traffic court, it's probably the only kind of introduction that that we most normal people, if you will, have with the justice system. So when you are thrown into a very complicated judicial system, which ours is, uh, with all of the, you know, the different steps that you know have to be gone through, through the investigation, through the charging, through uh, you know the trial, and all of those, in a you know a homicide case certainly can take years, and as you mentioned, your family or you, if it's um, you know a kid that whatever sort of um, injury that you've suffered, you're dealing with the impact of that and the results of that and then having to get your head around how you make sure that you know what's going on with your case. It's a lot to ex expect um, of anybody. And our prosecutors are, you know, they face a very difficult task there. Um, we have a lot of cases and they, you know, just simply don't have the time lots of times to make sure that every victim's member of their family is brought along. But Marcy's Law uh, would make that happen. And I think the timing is right for a number of reasons. One of the things is, as you said, we already have a base for what we're doing with the 1998 Constitutional Amendment, the Victims' Rights, um, Bill of Rights. But now we have technology and we have uh, some systems in place in the state of Tennessee, a Vines Court system, for instance, that allows um, a much easier uh, methodology for people to be made aware of 
when a case is going to be heard, what court it's going to be heard in, and uh, you know all of those things. So I again, at the end of the day, uh, as I presented Marcy's law in to the legislature and committee and on the floor, all we're doing with this legislation is making sure that we are balancing the rights of victims to the same level that we did for defendants. And again, it's just simply, um, it's a fairness issue. Yeah, and I, and I think it's important, you and I have had these conversations too, that um, that people throughout the process, the education <laughs> process, um, when you're talking about this legislation or this um, constitutional amendment, proposed constitutional amendment, is you know the victim's rights or constitutional rights um, are not a zero-sum game. So if you're giving rights in the state constitution to victims, you're not taking any constitutional that's rights correct. away from defendants. And that's all part of the legislative and educational process, which is why we're so grateful to you because you're such a good advocate for us, but you're also very good at explaining this to the lay person. And you have been for years now. Um, and this has not been uh, easy, as, as easy as it might seem uh, to talk about victims' rights, um, but to talk about how it impacts everybody, including the people that will be implementing it from sheriffs to prosecutors to chiefs of police. And I see that um, it, when it passed in the House most recently, it passed with bipartisan support, with the support of the Tennessee Sheriff's Association, with the support of the Tennessee chiefs of police. And that's really a tribute to you in the way that you and your colleagues have educated all of the stakeholders. Um, Senator Stevens, like I said, Senator Lundberg, who was also a guest um, on, on this uh, interview series. Um, and like you said, it comes at a time when, I mean, as recently as 2020, I know that uh, violent crime was up in Memphis, almost 25 percent. Uh, shootings resulting in injury I saw in Knoxville were up um, close to 40 percent in, in 2020 and the, the rise in gun violence in Chattanooga. So it is a statewide uh, statewide issue uh, to try to try to address um, and which is why having it addressed statewide through a constitutional amendment is why we think is the right the right process. Also, when you're talking with victims and their families, when a victim witness advocate is talking to and meeting a family for the first time or a prosecutor, um, so many times when a victim is in the system, it is very, uh, it, it's it's hard to explain why the accused has constitutional rights and victims have rights that might be in statute or might not be enforceable and certainly aren't constitutional rights. And so this is doing, like you said, balancing this out, making this an equal playing field and having victims really feel legitimately that they have a voice in the constitution and the system. Um, now, one of the things that, um, that, that we have talked about is the different rights that are going to be available and enforceable. Um, the fact that they will be notified of an accused release, like in Dr. Nicholas's case, uh, when the killer of his sister was out and they weren't notified of that. Um, in Tennessee, for instance, um, Tina Gregg, who was also a, um, who was also a, a, a guest on this interview series, her daughter was murdered and uh, was never notified by the local officials when the accused actually left the state. And she actually had, had to find out on Facebook um, what was happening. And that, as you and I have talked about before, that's just not right. And we've had other victims, family members on from Tennessee on this interview series, Joan Berry, uh, whose daughter, Jonna, was brutally murdered in West Knoxville in 2004. Uh, Jill Walker, whose daughter, Emma, uh, was murdered in a domestic violence incident, um, murdered by her high school sweetheart. All of these moms have turned this tragedy into a platform to try to help other victims. These selfless moms working with people like you are just an inspiration uh, for everybody um, who are looking at um, what can be done in situations like this to help um, to help the voiceless um, and the victimized. Well, it's you know, I don't think anybody who's not been through that kind of tragedy, and thankfully, gratefully, I have not. Um, we can empathize, but to truly understand that just senseless loss, um, it, you know, it's making sure that 
those families aren't victimized again by the system, that they aren't re-traumatized, as you said earlier, by just the process and not having a clear understanding of what's going to happen to, and even years later, if someone is you know, convicted of the crime, but they are at some point paroled, then the family needs to, to know about that before they see them on the street or see it on Facebook or whatever. And I think it's only fair that our judicial system be set up so that those victims and those families can have that sort of um, just knowledge. And again, one of the things that Marcy's Law will do will give victims mm -hmm. or their family members a right to speak, a right to be heard um, by the judge. They don't, they won't get to change the outcome, uh, you know, of the trial, but they will have an opportunity to make an impact statement um, to just let everybody in that courtroom, including the perpetrator of the crime, know in some small way uh, how that that has just devastated them and their families and changed their lives in a horrible way forever. So I think that's an important piece too, to just allowing people to have an opportunity to, to speak, to put that out there, to um, try and make other people understand just the level of devastation that can come with that sort of um, crime. Yes, and the right and the right to be heard is so important for um, ultimately for closure. Uh, to, the right to be heard at sentencing, for instance, the right to be heard at bail hearings, um, the right to be at heard parole hearings. If should they occur, it, exactly. And 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 that was going to be my 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 ultimate point was and the right to be heard at plea negotiations um, when a prosecutor and the prosecutor's office and defense counsel would get together and try uh, to resolve a case short of trial. Uh, to make sure that before that's done, uh, that the victim is heard um, throughout that process and ultimately in the courtroom, in public, um, so that they can let everybody know how they feel um, about what's going to happen and what the ultimate disposition of a case is. And to your point, uh, which is very important, at parole hearings, so many times decades will pass. Um, and it seems with all of the cases that have happened and all of the files that are in clerk's offices and courts and prosecutors' offices and defense lawyers' offices, um, that there's just so much volume and so many cases. But for every family, it's the one case that has changed their life forever. 20 years, 30 years, that has changed their life forever. And I think people would be surprised who aren't um, who aren't aware of these situations intimately, um, that it doesn't matter how long it has been. If somebody is going to have a parole hearing, even if it's a quarter of a century later, the person in that victim's family, even if it's somebody's grandchild, would like to have a voice and have, have a voice at the table and to be able to tell whoever the decision makers are how this has impacted their family really through generations. Uh, before anybody makes a decision on that person's release. And Marcy's Law would ensure constitutionally that that victim's family is notified. That's exactly right. And, you know, our parole um, board currently makes attempts to do that, but there's there's no enforceability again. Uh, and Marcy's Law will provide that. And I, I do want to say, you know, we are in, I feel good about our progress, but we have a ways to go as you, I'm sure you know, but your viewers might not know what the process is in Tennessee for um, a constitutional amendment. It's it's difficult, it's a high bar as it should be. You know, We don't need to be changing our constitution on a whim, but it requires passage by both the Senate and the House in one general assembly session. So it was passed in the House last term. I believe that Senator Stevens um, has every confidence and I have every confidence in the Senate that they're going to pass it um, in this part of the 113th General Assembly in Tennessee. But then in order for it to be a constitutional amendment, to be on the ballot, it has to pass again in our next General Assembly. That will be with the folks who are elected in this coming November. 
um, that group of people who were in the state house at that point in time, it had to pass this year just by simple majority. It has to pass next time by two thirds majority in both the House and the Senate, which is again, a pretty high bar. And then and only then will it go on the ballot for Tennessee citizens to vote on. And that will have that has to be on a ballot when uh, the governor is up for election. So, um, you know, the earliest we could have it on the ballot will be 2028, but um, I'm sorry, 2026. 2026, 2026. 2026, yeah. Right, and so the, the, the so much of the hard work has been done. So the first step, which is always most difficult to actually <laughs> get the first step done, which was pass it in the house, has been done through your leadership. Right. And now we're on to, and, and um, it's not an accident that I wanted to have this the last business day of 2023 going into 2024. So when we start 2024, Senator Stevens and all of his colleagues in the Senate are going to work to get the next step done, pass it in the Senate, and then we'll do the same thing, hopefully, House and the Senate next year. Then it gets- 2025, yes. And then it gets to the governor and to the voters in 2026 on the ballot. Um, so all of the work that you have done um, has resulted in getting this ball moving. And now the educational process continues um, and the awareness raising awareness process continues. And in fact, uh, you told me that one of the reasons that you're actually staying and running for reelection is to make sure that you can see this process all the way through. Is that right? That's true. It was a it was a difficult decision. You know, I've been there, as I said, I will be completing my fifth term. I never intended to be a career politician, uh, but this is one of the things that I want to to make sure we get finished. And we have, as you mentioned, we've had an educational process to get this far, but we'll have to have another educational process because the makeup of both the House and the Senate will change you know, to some degree with the next election, it always does. I have a number of my colleagues who've decided that they're not gonna run again. Um, there may be others, as I said, um, you know, I'm up for reelection. We could not be invited back. It's it's no guarantee. So there'll be new faces in the legislature that yeah. won't be aware of Marcy's law and the work that's been done. So it'll be a, a process to educate those folks before, before the next uh, vote in 2025. Well, as you know, we will stand arm in arm with you um, to help you do that. And we're appreciative of your leadership. And I want to um, read you something that um, probably hopefully will validate and affirm your decision to stay in um, and to continue to educate and get Marcy's law uh, passed um, as a constitutional amendment. Um, this is from Joan Berry, who's one, who's a, who's a, um, a a huge fan of yours. And uh, uh, Joan is one of the, the the women that I talked about, one of the moms whose daughters, uh, whose daughter was murdered, um, her daughter, Jonna Berry. And she wrote, this is from Joan Berry, on, De on December 6th, 2004, my daughter, Jonna, a bright and ambitious student at the University of Tennessee, was brutally stabbed and murdered. As the mother of a daughter who passed away during a violent crime, I know how important it is for victims' families to have a voice in the criminal legal system. The emotional, physical, and mental toll of losing a loved one can easily make their families feel helpless and forgotten, and that is only exacerbated by the justice system. I know how it feels to be kept in the dark when it comes to updates regarding court proceedings and the accused. Along with the emotions surviving victims and their loved ones feel in the aftermath of a horrific crime, they must deal with the anger, exhaustion, and despair of traversing the criminal court system. Marcy's Law, however, provides victims and their families with a tool to regain control, which is often difficult under the construct of our justice system. And she goes on to mention you specifically. And she says, I'm grateful to State Representative Patsy Hazelwood and Senator John Stevens for leading the effort to pass Marcy's Law and to all of the members of the Tennessee House who co-sponsored and supported the legislation. It is my hope that during the next legislative session that we just talked about, the Senate joins them in supporting this crucial step towards making sure victims of violent crimes and their families are not re-victimized by the judicial system. Victims of crime should have rights, and it's time to ensure they do. That is enough motivation, I hope, to keep you in the fight um, and to let you know how much 
everyone appreciates all the work that you do. And that includes us at Marcy's Law. Well, thank you. And it's I'm truly honored to have the opportunity to work on this. Um, as we have said, I don't have personal experience in this regard, but when I started hearing some of these stories, uh, it, it's a fairness issue. And I think Marcy's Law will make sure that we are as fair to victims of crime as we are to those who are charged with perpetrating that crime. So um, I look forward to the Senate passing it in 2024, and I look forward to the Senate and the House passing it with a two-thirds majority in 2025 so that it can be on the ballot in 2026 when Tennessee elects its next governor. Great. Th thank you so much. And thanks so much once again for taking the time uh, this week when time is so precious. And uh, have a happy new year. And thanks again for everything, Representative Hazelwood. Happy new year to you as well. All right. Thank you.